Aloha. Welcome to American Issues, Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Today's title is Brazil Has Its January 6th Event, Trump's Election Denial Virus Spreads. You know, like, like fashion, we have trends in fashion, some good, some absolutely horrible. Um, thinking of uh, polyester bell bottoms in the 1970s. Well, political uh, activities have trends too. And some far, far worse than polyester bell bottoms. And specifically, I'm referring to election denials. And Donald Trump's election denials for his loss in 2020 is definitely spreading like a virus. Um, I'll cite uh, Carrie Lake from Arizona and her election denials that she, uh, she didn't lose the election and she fought it to the bitter end. And then after the election, she fought it further. Uh, no chance of winning, but she felt compelled to fight it. And now we have uh, ex-president Bolsonaro of Brazil, who did exactly almost the same things as Donald Trump did. And that is, before the election took place, he said that um, it's a rigged election and that if he lost or if he didn't win, it would have been a rigged election. And as the events unfolded, lo and behold, it's a copycat uh, event to January 6th. So we're, we're here to discuss that. Uh, starting off with Jay Fidel, my co-host. Welcome, Jay. Our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and our ever, ever, ever lovely Cynthia Sinclair, our contributor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning. Tim. Jay, yeah. I'd like to start with you and ask you, to your estimation or, or opinion, to what degree is this Brazil's uprising and uh, attack on their national Congress, their su Supreme Court and presidential offices, to what degree do you see similarities to our January 6th event? A large degree, you know? There's some things that, obvious, that are obvious. For example, on 9-11, when the first plane crashed into the first tower, I said, oh my goodness, that's, you know, that's bad piloting. Uh, gee whiz, wonder what happened there. That fellow just wasn't watching. When the second plane crashed in, it was easy. You know, that had to be coordinated attack. It becomes obvious. It becomes certain. And I think as we learned the details of what happened in Brasilia, uh, we became certain um, that this was copycat. It reminds me of something, you guys may be too young for this, but in, in the 60s, um, there was a, a group that was making bombs in Brooklyn. Um, and they made a bomb. They didn't make it very well, and it blew up the building in which they were making it. Okay, a few days later, uh, there was a building in Chicago that went up the same way because people were doing copycat. Um, they, you know, they get it in the media, they, they copy it. And in this case, we know that Twitter was, was instrumental in the Brasilia uh, insurrection. Um, and that it, it was uh, fomenting unrest for a while. Um, and um, it, 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 lots of misinformation and disinformation, which people bought. And so, um, you know, Twitter uh, is, is the, uh, what do you want to call it, the engine of choice. The other thing I want to mention in this regard is that, uh, you know, we do a lot of shows overseas. And when we do them overseas, and I talk to people who are very far away at all points of the earth, I always ask them, you know, have you been watching 60 Minutes? Uh, have you been getting, you know, the news from the United States? Do you know what's going on with Trump and in Washington and Congress, you know, the Select Committee and Mar-a-Lago and all that? And they say, sure we do. Silly question. They always do. What I'm telling you is American media reaches to all points of the earth in all languages, all cultures, everywhere. And so um, if you thought that the people in Brazil were not following what happened on January 6th, if you thought they were not following, you know, the select committee and all the aggravation in Congress, um, you can be sure they were following. So this is not only copycat, they're, they're part of the fabric the global fabric of what's going on. And so there's no, no issue in my mind whatsoever that uh, Jair Bolsonaro um, was copying and the people who followed him were copying uh, thoughtlessly and without regard to uh, whatever democracy exists in Brazil. 
it was, interestingly enough, it wasn't only the same effect, it was the same cause. <laughs> right. You know, it shows that we've, we've had before, we've used the term stochastic terrorism rhetoric. Um, now, we don't follow Brazilians' news, uh, news like may follow ours. Uh, to what degree do you think uh, there was dog whistles or was it bullhorns? that uh, Bolsonaro was using to basically uh, in encourage and incite this attack. I, I don't speak Portuguese, so I don't know exactly what was happening on the ground, but I'll, make a, I'll, make, I'll connect the dots on this and say it, it was a bullhorn of social media. And furthermore, what I thought was interesting is uh, uh, that when Bolsonaro uh, retired to uh, Florida, we should discuss that, you know, that, that event. Um, uh, he was uh, heard to be, seen to be, reported to be meeting with members of the Trump retinue. Um, so he's been in touch with Trump, and Trump is friendly with him. If you just, uh, you know, Google Trump and Bolsonaro, you find a lot of photographs of the two of them together, admiring each other. Uh, both autocrats, both motivated the same way. And I suggest that not only was Bolsonaro watching what happened in January, January 6th. Um, but he was in touch, um, you know, with the uh, members of the Trump coterie um, and getting even instructions on how you do this really well. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Hey, Chuck, uh, you've had a few days to let this settle into our, our consciousness. And what's your take on it? To what degree... Is this an exact copycat or, I mean, uh, to what degree is Trump's influence on ex-president Bolsonaro? Uh, what's, your, what's your read on it? Well, I think Jay's insights are good. They're well-founded. And you see close connections and communications between Bolsonaro and his people and Bannon and Ali Alexander and, you know, that troika of election deniers that were January 6th promoters. And of course, Bannon's still saying to Bolsonaro, go full speed ahead, go on the attack. But a couple of things. One is the timing. And that's a major difference here because Bolsonaro and his supporters actually waited to implement this until after the transfer of power had taken place. So it enabled Lulu to do a couple of things. One was to get in touch with and get strong support from international leaders, Biden, Macron, and others. The second thing was to assemble and get strong unified support from his government leaders, his attorney general, his Supreme Court, chief justice, and, and others. So one of the things that's gonna be interesting to see is that Bolsonaro's faction still has a very, very strong presence and voting sector in Brazil's Congress. So what happens with legislation down the line it is going to be interesting. Whether it'll change election results or the transfer of power, eh, not much more likely than with Trump. Or, or similar to our Congress, gridlock. Well, and recognize one other thing with Trump. <clears throat> Trump not only initiated the rigged election claims before the election took place, but literally as soon as the election was being called by major networks, <clears throat> he started to put that out there in a concerted network of people as a fundraising device. Right. That's always been Trump's main mechanism. Get control of the money, get control of the donors, and use that for his political power and his base. And good. that's a distinction. I Yeah, those, those are good observations. Yeah. Thanks, Chuck. Cynthia, you know, like Trump, um, he started wildly pointing fingers on how it was possible to lose the election and one one of the directions he pointed into was the election machines and then another direction as far as fake news. Well, that's exactly what ex-president Bolsonaro has done. 
Uh, any surprise to that? What are, what other similarities did you, did you note or have you witnessed on this uh, this attack on in Brazil and upon the House of Congress? Uh, Steve Bannon <laughs> is the number one connection between Trump and Bolsonaro, and he's the number one connection behind some of these strategies that they use. He went on his war, you know, in his war room podcast just days after this all happened, praising them and defending what they said and and defending what he believed was correct in the sense of there there must have been fraud. We knew there was going to be fraud. It must be the voting machines. And if anyone was paying attention to what happened in the 2020 election, they can see the incredible you know, similarities between both what happened in Brazil and what happened here in the United States. And then Bannon doesn't stop there. He's over in Hungary and he's over in Europe and he is stoking these same flames everywhere that he possibly can. And so I was just feeling more and more angry as I was reading more and more about Bannon's involvement in all of this and thinking about the fact that the judge is letting him walk around while he's waiting for the sentencing, is letting him walk around, keep his podcast, and keep spewing these lies and fomenting these um, insurrections, not just here, but everywhere around the world. And so I, do you think oh. Bannon may be in violation of the Logan Act, which is to say a citizen interferes with the, the agenda of the United States of America? Or is this just a matter of freedom of speech, First Amendment? You know, where, where do we stop? You know, you can't walk into a theater and cry fire um, and then have people die and you are responsible. So... Bannon cried fire in a packed, you know, theater. Um, and, and I use that analogy that the packed theater was our Congress. He went in and he cried fire and people died. And yet he's just the only thing that he's been in trouble for at this moment is for not answering a subpoena. And I don't understand how it is that he's not being charged with more. and. When, and I mean, I understand it's a big case and, um, you know, he likes to go slowly and all this stuff. But when is Merrick Garland going to do something, mm -hmm. not just say he's doing something behind the scenes? When's he actually going to open the door and let us see what is really happening? You know, Jay suggested that there may be communications or could, there could have been some communications between Bolsonaro and, and the Trump gang. Um, if that were ever proven to be true, uh, do you think there'd be any consequences from it? But we already know that it is. We How do know, we know? That, we know that Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo Bolsonaro, he was down there. He was up here. Um, Bannon and Steve Miller, and he lunched with all kinds of people while he was here. He went to South Dakota and met with all of the election deniers that are up there. And so they know that these things are happening. So it's not like we don't have proof already. We, we already have. I mean, we may we have the appearance that there may have been some, you know, um, clandestine meeting, but. We really don't know for a fact that that took place. Uh, what should we do about it? And should there be further investigation on that point? There should absolutely be more investigation. We do know that it took place. What we don't know is what they talked about. That's where we kind of have to just uh, think about the circumstances and then guess what maybe they were talking about, especially since shortly after he left, is when all this stuff started happening in Brazil. So the, the coincidental, coincidental timing of it all speaks volumes, if you yeah. ask. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Hey, Jay, where does Trump's virus stop? When does that stop? 
I, I made a reference to fashion trends, bad ones, good ones. Uh, eventually, all trends in the fashion world, they stop. Uh, what about this political trend, uh, election denial? Does, does that stop anytime soon? And if so, when? Short answer, there's no indication it is stopping or will stop, or that even an indictment and a conviction will stop it. But, you know, I'd like to visit one other thing you touched on uh, earlier today, and, and that is, uh, you know, what? why did Trump do that? We know he did this, okay? directly or indirectly. I think we can be really or, or relatively comfortable about that. Why? Why did he do this? And I think the answer is attention, um, attention to Bolsonaro, um, having effect overseas, but also, you know, the big one, the distraction one, right? The master of distraction. You want to have a reality show, you know, distract like a magician, you know, from one hand to the other. So nobody knows what's going on. <clears throat> and I think... Um, you know, he, he did this. He did it intentionally. Bannon did it intentionally on his behalf. And, and the reason was, let's get the heat. Let's get the heat off Trump. Let's get the heat off January 6th. Let's show the world that this kind of stuff happens. And it is, um, you know, it is, it, it is justified in other places. Maybe, just maybe, it was justified here, too. That's one element um, you know, why did he do that? Why is he cavorting with Bolsonaro at all? The second thing is, um, you know, is, is there an effect here? Is there an effect on autocracy? Is there an effect on global, the liberal world order? Is there an effect on, on Putin's, uh, you know, uh, uh, attack, uh, invasion into Ukraine? Um, is it effect on, you know, is it an effect on world peace, world stability? And whether Trump intended it or not, and I suspect he did, and just to make a distraction and to keep the, the heat off him, um, I think it, it has had an effect. I mean, look at, the, look at the crowds in where Peru right now and people getting killed in the street and everybody, you know, uh, doing a violent protest. There'll be other places in Latin America that will follow, I suspect. And if we look carefully at the news, we'll we'll see other places in the world. It's like, you know, this event, and to the extent Trump is involved, Trump, and to the extent Trump was involved in January 6th, clearly, um, it has the tendency of spreading through social media, through international communications and media of all kinds, uh, and it destabilizes the world. Uh, I, I think, you know, he's had an effect that's worse than what we here uh, on Think Tech have been talking about for the past five years. He has an international effect, and it is destabilizing at least Brazil and indirectly maybe you know Peru, maybe other countries, hither and yon. We are in a bad time here. You know, this is not going to be a, a fair question, but it's going to be a tough question. And there's, if if... If you're a fragile democracy, either in Central America, South America, or Eastern Europe, or wherever, um, how do you insulate yourself from this Trump election denial virus that's spreading around the world, or seemingly spreading around the world? What do you do to what do you do to prevent it from uh, toppling your government uh, during the next election? I want to make one other point about um, about that. You know. So Bolsonaro goes to Florida. Why did he go to Florida? I mean, there was something about him going to a hospital there that sounds like poppycock to me. Um, and uh, he went to Florida, I think, to meet with the, the people in the Trump administration. But, but that's my, my view of it. Uh, what, what's obvious is that uh, it's, he makes himself deniable. Um, you know, by going to Florida and by setting it up after power has transferred, he makes himself deniable. Um, and, you know, it's harder to have a, a Trump-like investigation into his, his steps. Um, how do we, and, and he may be the guy we're, we're waiting for. He did get the, uh, you know, the federal authorities to arrest them, thousands of people that day and the next day. You got to give him credit for that. Uh, presumably he's going to try them. Presumably the courts are going to give him a, a trial. 
uh, and he'll do better, actually, than the Department of Justice in, in this country, uh, which hasn't done very well. And I agree with Cynthia. You know, it's that metronome back and forth every day. I wake up in the morning and I say, is this the day? Well, no, it's not the day. And Jack Smith, is this the day? No, it's not the day. When is the day? There is no day. Watch. Keep waking up in the morning and asking yourself. The, the question is, what does uh, Lulu, Lula do? Okay, if he succeeds in squashing Bolsonaro's uprising, we have some lessons to learn from him. Um, and I'm not saying they're all sweet and lovely. They're not necessarily the kind of liberal things, progressive things that you would want. But if they work, we need to watch that. And countries around the world that are in jeopardy, democracies that are in jeopardy uh, of the same process, they need to watch that. As for a formula, you know, that we can all agree on right now today on how to deal with an insurrection that comes from disgruntled people who take too much information out of Twitter and social media. I don't think there's an easy answer. I don't think there's a formula. I think we're still learning. Unfortunately, the lessons are hard. Okay. Hey, Chuck, is there going to be any, how should I say, a ripple effect that comes back from Brazil? I mean, Clearly, the ripple, <laughs> the rock was thrown in the lake, a calm lake. The ripple hit from uh, Trump to Bolsonaro to Brazil. Is there going to be a ripple that comes back to the United States as far as uh, further encouragement for, for, you know, protest, not protest, but some kind of uh, insurrection against the government in some different form at some different time? Not necessarily an election, but uh, is this a virus that just keeps on giving? It's a great question, and it, it, Cynthia's and Jay's insights are spot on, and they tie directly back to the domestic essential element function that election denial serves for Trump and the Republicans. It's the center not only of their fundraising and their power brokering, but, but it's also the center of their voting rights strategies for gerrymandering, for voter restriction, for voter suppression for changing the electoral process and accessibility to it, because they have now lost two straight mm -hmm. major national. Well, I, I guess that goes to the point election. of why continue with the strategy of election denial when you just lost big on the midterms? Why? Why? I, I get the fundraising concept and all that. But uh, at some point, is there a voice of reason that says, hey, election denial is not winning us elections and placing um, Republicans in these seats. I want to add one thing to the pot for Chuck. And that is, you know, we, um, we thought, we, we suspected that the insurrection would happen again. And in fact, in, in Brazil, they're talking about having another insurrection, same kind of thing. Um, insurrections don't go away after the day is done. Uh, they come back. And in the United States, um, the speculation is they come back in different form. They mutate. OK, and what we have now in Congress with the Republicans knocking, you know, threatening to knock off Social Security, threatening to investigate the investigation, um, threatening to impeach um, clearly responsible members of government. Um, that's just madness is madness that's going on in the House um, to say nothing of the debt ceiling. Um, I, su I suggest for Trump's answer, I mean, for Chuck's answer, that the Trumpers, OK, um, are still engaged in an insurrection. It's not a violent insurrection. It's an insurrection in the House. These people are motivated by these are the same people, the same people motivated by the, the same strange and crazy motivations. And they're doing it under what do you want to call it? Color of law. So we mm -hmm. still have a kind of mutated, nuanced insurrection going on. What do you think, Chuck? No, I think that's exactly right. And we would not have the slim Republican majority in the House were it not for the gerrymandering and the election law changes that were made. That made the difference in those votes. What they'll be able to do with it is open to question given the Senate and given the executive. But the Republicans, Jay is spot on. 
the Republicans are going to continue to attack on both fronts, violent insurrection with those supporters and the law changing anti-constitutional, anti-voting rights strategies that have worked to give them what power they do have. Okay. Cynthia, would, do, you, do you agree with Jay and Chuck that <clears throat> there's a ripple effect that's coming back uh, or never left the United States, thanks to Donald Trump and his, his acolytes? Do you agree that there's going to be some forms of, I, I don't want to use the word insurrection, but some form of um, undermining of the rule of law or, and or the Constitution that takes place in this country in the near future, far future? Uh, in some fashion and form. What's your opinion? I want to use the word insurrection. And it's yeah? okay. inside out, you know. It was happening from the outside in before, and now it's happening from the inside out. And the very same people that are under investigation for that very insurrection are now asking to be on the committee that will investigate the investigation. So they will have access to all of the materials and evidence and all of that that is an it's such a conflict, a clear conflict of interest that it is absolutely outrageous to even think that it's happening. I couldn't watch anymore. I had to turn off the news yesterday because I was so upset at this. How can <laughs> I feel like that every day. <laughs> how can, I'm screaming at the television and I realize just turn it off. Take a break, go for a walk, you know. Um, I want to go back to Brazil for a minute because I have a quote that um, came out from, uh, from Bolsonaro in September, just before the election in October, right? And he says, the patience of the people has run out. I want to tell those who want to make me unelectable in Brazil, that only God removes me from power. There are three options for me, jail, death, or victory. And I'm telling the scoundrels, I will never be imprisoned. Now, who does that sound like? Almost word for word, the thing that we heard when he came out and he said, I am ordained by God, when Trump came out and said, God's the one who, you know, I'm his, uh, what was it is, I'm his missionary? No, it was... And God's chosen one, that's what it was. And so here we are again, Bolsonaro's using these same terms, the same the coincidence of that, again, is not, you can't say that it's not there. And we know that Bannon, once again, is the guy who instigated that to come and, and he's the one who suggested that he talk that way, um, Trump. And then now we find out that he also was the one that was advising Bolsonaro. And we also know that in the same month, Don Jr. was down with a televised message to Brazil and the people that were in Bolsonaro's camp. And this is all happening just before the election. So there's no doubt that it wasn't just Bannon or Stephen Miller or one of the, or Jason Miller, but it could have also been the Trump family. And we already know that if the Trump family is doing this, then it is because Trump approved it. But you know what? The communications between them are going to be much harder to establish. Yeah. Because it's everybody's in there tight. Uh, you can start an investigation into this, lots of luck. Nobody's yeah, going to tell you anything. Well, Cynthia, you know, if Trump is God's chosen one, then God's chosen one will soon be indicted. And I guess that leads me to the question is, what, what's in store for Bolsonaro when he leaves Florida and returns back to Brazil? Um, Jay pinpointed, and I think Chuck pinpointed the fact that they handled this insurrection far differently than the United our, our Department of Justice. My God, there was 209 people arrested that day, and then the next day, 1,000 people were, were um, picked up. Uh, all have been released except for 527, but they clearly have handled this insurrection far, far faster and more strident than we have. What, in what way will Barcelona be treated differently than the laissez-faire treatment that Donald Trump has received thus far? 
The police said that they have detained a total of some 1,500 people and have released around 600, but they were all elderly or mothers with children and unhoused people, among others, for humanitarian reasons. Now, um, talk about a difference between the two. What was there, maybe 200 that were arrested? I don't even think there were that many that were arrested the day of the American insurrection, right? And we're still only up to like 600 people that have been arrested. A few that have been charged, mostly given these light sentences, right? That's the part I don't understand either is why they're being given these, you know, five months, six months of, you know, of probation and no jail time. And even the head guys, well, we well, do know yeah. that the I mean, Proud, the Boy, Proud guys, Boy guys, they're getting multiple years of, of incarceration. Yeah, 10 years and, you know, more. And so that part is different. But we have to see how it shakes out in the courts for down there as opposed to up here. But the immediate, that was my first reaction as I was watching it. There were just lines of people on the ground with their hands behind their backs. And I thought, boy, we sure didn't see that here, did we? Okay, so how does that translate to how Bar Bolsonaro is going to be treated when he returns? Well, there's lots of talk that I found anyway about making an assumption that he's going to return. That's true. I am. That, that is up to Joe Biden in the uh, immigration service. Uh, they could let him stay in Florida for a long time and operate remotely and, and do lots of damage, or they could force him out, force him back. And that's a choice that uh, Bolsonaro would like to have control over. But ultimately, it's it's Joe Biden. And I think that choice is going to have a huge effect on the answer to your question. Right. Any bets, Jay? No, no pizza you'll, bets, you'll but get, any bets whether or not Biden says it's time to go, because um, I don't want to harbor uh, <laughs> a, a Trump wannabe. Well, I think it, it will, uh, bad optics. If Biden lets him stay in the country, it looks like he's supporting him in some way. Absolutely. If he sends him back, uh, then it'll be uh, a, a, a crisis test of Brazil's democracy and Lula's power. Yeah. Hey, Chuck, what do you think? Uh, how Bolsonaro going to be treated? Does he go back? Does he claim that he wants to stay in the United States longer? And how do we respond? Or how does the Biden administration respond to that? Hey, well, they already have. <laughs> right from the beginning, Anthony Blinken was saying he's got 30 days to give us a, a legally justifiable reason to stay. Other than that, without that, he's gone. So I agree with Jay. There's no reason to keep him here. Was he, what if Bolsonaro says, hey, I can't get a fair trial? Um, they're going to overtly charged me for something I wasn't involved with, and I won't be able to get a fair trial. Therefore, I'm claiming refugee status. <laughs> well, is that, no, that might be treated as a good reason. You know, I think they've already linked him through social media, haven't they? They've already linked him through some of his social media posts to fomenting this, um, this insurrection. You know, I, I agree with Chuck in the sense that um, it's so easy for Bolsonaro um, to concoct uh, a murder threat, you know, a death threat, uh, so easy to make himself uh, a victim um, and seeking sanctuary in this country. So I guess at the end of the day, this is a, um, you know, it's a it's a public opinion question. Uh, just just how how can he present himself to advance whatever he wants to advance the notion he he's yeah okay I don't have a good reason I'll have to go back or I have a good reason. Uh, they'll kill me if I go back. And I, you know, can you please give me sanctuary and actually apply for it? I have a question um, because I have seen a lot of, sorry to just jump in, but I've seen all these reports of the expatriates and people that are on vacation here in America going to where he is in Kissimmee, Florida and wanting, you know, uh, autographs and whatnot from him, lots and lots of them. 
will that have an effect on whether or not he's allowed to stay? Because there's so many people that want him to stay. Does that even enter into the process? Well, that raises a very interesting question, because those people are probably part of Trump's base. You know, they're right wing conservatives. They're lawless. And um, they could make, um, you know, a, a big stink. And, and who who benefits by that? Trump. Yeah. You know, we've run out of time, so I'm going to go to Chuck with his last thoughts. I think Jay and Cynthia have summed it up pretty well here. <clears throat> there are far more urgent pressing issues on our plate. Uh, Bolsonaro doesn't need to be one of them. All of the things that he could now argue might be reasons for him to stay are things that could have been anticipated and probably were present before he left. He made a choice. He should live with the choice. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Cynthia? Um, I want to see him uh, indicted. I want to see him arrested. I want to see him sent back to Brazil. And then I want to see Trump indicted and arrested and thrown in jail. Um, but in the same way that Bolsonaro made that that, you know, quote about that quote I read about him never going to jail. And I'm afraid that we won't ever, no matter what happens with Bolsonaro and or Trump, that indicted, arrested, tried, convicted, neither one of them are going to go to jail because they will run before they get a chance to get put in jail. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. Jay, you get the last word. I'm not. I'm not uh, optimistic about um, about uh, uh, retribution um, for Trump, or even proceedings that will stop him from his quote campaign end quote. Um, the idea that Alan Weisenberg got uh, what what did he get five five months in jail, and he'll get for 15 years of crime, um, and he'll probably wind up getting out of there in three months, 90 days. You could count them real quick, 90 days for all of that. That was not a success. I'm sorry. Um, and Fannie Willis, I, I thought that Fannie Willis had a real grand jury impaneled already. Now come to find it was only a, a grand jury to make a report. And she has to start a second grand jury. Uh, I don't know if that's the law in Georgia or, or it's a, her discretion as prosecutor, but it doesn't make me feel like things are moving as fast as I had hoped in Georgia for an open and shut case with his crime you know, reported and re repeated. And so I'm not all that confident about anything happening soon in Georgia either. And then, you know, going back to the metronome, um, you know, I, I, you know, we all said, hey, you gotta, you gotta do something before uh, the Democratic majority ends in Congress. If you don't do it before, things will derail whatever the select committee decided and recommended. Um, and of course, they didn't do anything. And it was very nice. They gave us a report at the last business day of the year. Um, but the, 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 you know, the fact is the Department of Justice and Jack Smith are still doing the metronome every morning. And it isn't happening. <clears throat> Public confidence has, has got to be waning on that. I know mine is. I don't think the Department of Justice is, is doing its job here. It hasn't and it isn't. And th thus, I don't I'm not confident it will do it in the future. This is really bad in terms of the way people, not only in this country, but around the world, perceive American democracy, American rule of law, American justice. All right. You know, if I had to choose between bad political trends and specifically trends of election denial that attempt to weaken a legitimate elections in fragile democracies or fashion trends, I'd like to pick bad polyester bell bottoms. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to thank my guests, special esteemed guest Chuck Crumpton, our contributor Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and my co-host Jay Fidel. Thank you one and all for coming today and, and sharing your opinions and thoughts. Uh, Tim Apicelli, your host for American Issues Take One, won't you join us next week? Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.